right, everybody. Welcome to episode 288 of Psycho's Platters. Always powered by coffee each and every time. So, I know it's been a little while. I'm sorry. You know, I've, I've uh, had a few days off. Just haven't, I haven't really felt like doing one of these for a while. Um, I've been meaning to. I love you, VC. Just haven't had a chance. So, let's go, uh, this is going to be mostly LP finds, but I'm also going to show some goofy stuff towards the end, okay? Ah, damn it. No, I am not in the mood for this. Ugh. You can always tell when it's been unedited. <laughs> uh, I'm just not in the mood to deal with people at the moment. Except you guys, because I'm talking to you guys. So... LP finds. Uh, this is, let's see, these first here, first couple, BCLT from Doug Fields. Yeah, yeah, good old Dougie Fresh. Uh, I went with him. He uh, he gave me he gave me these, which was really really cool. From 1968, it's a two I Columbia stereo. Peace of mind LP from Paul Revere and the Raiders. That's right. The main single off of here, Peace of Mind. Uh, but I actually. I saw a recent appearance of I Don't Want Nobody to Lead Me On. Uh, this is pretty much the Raiders going uh, soul. They went into Memphis and uh, and got this cut, uh, I'm led to believe, pretty much uh, fly-by-night. Uh, barely anybody knew. Chips Moman, famous producer, he went off and produced this. Of course, Mark Lindsay arranged this uh, along with Chips as well. It's not a bad record. This is the front. This is the back. It's just something a little different. Uh, go check out uh, their version of Soul Man. That's kind of interesting, to say the least. So, peace of mind from the Raiders in 68. Also, I grabbed this while I was there, too. I'm always, it just looked interesting. Uh, from Sarasota, Florida in 1987, the band Alias. Yes. Uh, you know why? On, uh, on Grunge Records... Here's the front, here's the back. Uh, not too bad, not too bad uh, for, for the hair metal here from 87. So very grateful that he let me have those. Along with, uh, I can't seem to find it right this minute, but um, a, a couple copies of the Monkees listen to the Band 45, because... I haven't had it in quite some time, uh, so very grateful. I gave one to Donna Jo Cat Lady, and then I kept one, too, because I'm still looking for a couple of those Monkees 45s. Also picked up two very cool albums. Actually, most of this is pretty cool, but um, still on a Frank Marino and Mahogany Rush kick. He's coming in October. Strange Universe. Oh, oh, I love this album. I'm not kidding you. Probably my favorites on here, Tales of Spanish Warrior, um, Satisfy Your Soul, Land of a Thousand Nights, uh, Strange Universe to close out the album. Just really damn good stuff from Frank Marino and Mahogany Rush. And then I just got done listening to Mahogany Rush 4, which is the first album for Columbia Records. Uh, the first three were from 20th Century Records. Still continuing that power trio. Also grabbed up, uh, very reasonably priced, Uriah Heep's first album, that's right, from late 1969. Uh, I always liked the David Byron era, probably is my most favorite. Uh, on here, on a couple tracks, Nigel Olson, who would end up drumming for Elton John and Billy Joel and others, uh, he got sort of his start here. Um, Gypsy. Gypsy is one of my favorite tracks off of here, but I love this whole album. I like Uriah Heep in general. Uh, prog hard rock, that's what I figure on this. These next ones only cost me three bucks. Uh, I had this a long, long time ago on Rec Track Records. Precious Stones picture disc. That's right. Here's the front. This is the back. Um, this this uh, came from... Um, I think this is a uh, Dutch release, I want to say, if I remember correctly on this. I could be wrong. But uh, but all of this here, uh, every bite came from uh, October 1965 interviews. So I thought pretty neat. I just really like 
I'm a sucker for picture discs. Three bucks. That's all it cost me was three bucks. Along with a gold stamped 1978 CBS Records Flint. Here's the front. Here's the back. Who's Flint, you ask? Anybody know who Flint was? Oh, way in the back there. Who said <laughs> three quarters of the broken up Grand Funk Railroad? Well, that's absolutely correct. It's everybody in Grand Funk at the time other than Mark Farner, although most of this album was recorded in the swamp, which was Mark's studio in Michigan. They added two new band members that I never heard of, and, uh, and to top that off on guest guitar, most of the guest guitar work was Todd Rundgren. Frank Zappa is also guitarist on two of these tracks, too. It's not a great album, but it's not a bad album either, so check it out from 1978. They recorded a second one called Lay It On The Line in 79, but it never came out, to my knowledge, anyway. Next. I like the knack. Did I get the knack in 1979? Yeah, I got the knack in 1979, but we're not talking get the knack. We're talking about 1981's Round Trip, the last album that they had on Capitol Records. Here's the front, here's the back. I remember when this was in the cutout bin, uh, <laughs> really dirt cheap. I didn't pay much for this album either. Uh, but of course, the last album for quite some time from these guys. Um, not only do you have the knack on here, but uh, Flo and Eddie. <laughs> yeah, Flo and Eddie are on here on a couple tracks. Mark Volman does an extra individual track. You also got the Chicago horn section. Yeah, the horn section from Band Chicago's on here. And Tom Scott makes an appearance too. Personally, my favorite track on here, Radiating Love. I like Radiating Love, but Pay the Devil's also pretty good too. Another Lousy Day in Paradise. Uh, search this one out. I think uh, it, for Power Pop, it's pretty cool. This next one here from 1989 on RCA slash Simmons Records, as in Gene Simmons' imprint. Silent Rage, Don't Touch Me There. Here's the front, here's the back. This is not a bad record, honestly. This is the second album that this band did, um, but this album has a new member change. Uh, you have two members in this band that had loose kiss connections other than part of this album is produced by Gene Simmons. Part of it is produced by the AOR guitarist Paul Sabu. Uh, I guess he was pretty big in the 80s. But E.J. Curse, um, he ended up co-writing songs with Gene for Kiss's Revenge album and Psycho Circus. And then Brian James Fox is the drummer on this album, and he's not on the first one from Chameleon Records in 87, but Brian James Fox, uh, he ended up drumming for White Tiger, which also had Mark St. John uh, after he left Kiss. So, yeah. So you end up having, uh, having uh, two minor Kiss connections in this one. Like I said, not a bad record, honestly, uh, for this. And then lastly, um, some people are going to go... Well, no, wait a minute. I got one more before that. Sorry. From uh, 1969, on, a, on, Red Elect on, dang it, on Red Electra, Rhinoceros. Yes, Rhinoceros. Here's the front. Here's the back. Uh, you've got two former members of Iron Butterfly along with a former drummer for the Mothers of Invention. Throw them all in together with a bunch of other people and you got Rhinoceros. I really thought this would be a good album. It kind of was boring to me, I'm not going to lie. They say the first album's a little bit better, so I may try to check that out. But uh, So Rhinoceros, Satin Chickens from 1969. This next one here... I didn't even know they made it on vinyl. I was actually pretty happy to find it. This is not an American press. This is this is a German press. Leonard Skinner, 1991. That's right, on Atlantic Records. It's stamped, pro, uh, labeled promotion cop and not for sale. So for the 91 bit, this is probably the last album that is going to have the most 
original and classic lineup Skinner members. Um, Smokestack Lightning was the single off of this, uh, but pretty much you've got you've got all your classic classic lineup people pre Crash Skinner, Gary Rossington, Ed King, Leon Wilkinson, Billy Powell, Artemis Pyle. Okay. Um, after this, Artemis gets booted out. Johnny Van Zandt, of course, does the vocals. Custer comes in for some of the drums. This is not a great album, but it's not a bad album. Uh, I'm glad at least that the guys tried. Okay, this this um, came off of the reunion tour from 87, 88. And they managed to do this. I remember when this first came out, and I got it on CD back in 91. But this didn't come out in American Vinyl. So, uh, European press, if you're a Skinner Vinyl fanatic, grab this one. I am told The Last Rebel from 93, which I think, uh, yeah, that, that was Atlantic too. Uh, that one's even tougher to get on vinyl than this one is. So, Skinner 91, look for that. So, two oddball things I want to show you, <laughs> and then I'm going to get off of here. I went to a... Um, Flea Market e Antique Mall crap uh, yesterday with my one of my besties, Donna Jo Cat Lady. And I found this and I could not pass this up, especially because it was on sale. I know you're going to roll your eyes. Here it comes. It's original 1977 Adonia Marie washable, <laughs> washable record and toy carrying case. Look at this. Here's the front, here's the back, and all their cheeky white teethy goodness. This is actually in really, really good shape. There's like a very small, itty-bitty tear. Other than that, here it is. So, <laughs> no Hawaiian punch containers in here. Oh, boy. I, I'm, I'm, I, seven bucks. I, I couldn't pass this up. I see it goes for 50 or more on eBay and other little places. That is, if you can find somebody to buy it. But, hey, I bought it because it's amusing. Now you just need to find a kiss at a, and a, what other popular record cases would have been? Bay City Rollers? I don't know. So that's the first thing. Second thing, I was at a Goodwill. I, I know a lot of your states, you know, your guys' uh, resale shops are closed, okay? Uh, here in Arkansas, uh, there's only one chain that's open, Goodwill. Goodwill is open. They decided to keep open, but they reduced down to Sunday hours all, for the whole week, all right? Uh, Salvation Armies, they closed. The small ones closed. I think there's one uh, there's one other non goodwill one that I've seen open in Northwest Arkansas. So Donna Joe Cat Lady and I we were over there today, which both goodwills actually got vinyl. They did. Uh, there was a batch uh, at the other goodwill of of 70s and early 80s funk, which I would have got excited about, except I could tell that this was owned by a DJ slash scratcher and the condition on the damn things I, I I couldn't do anything with them so when I found this and it made me laugh oh my god you're, you're gonna roll your eyes oh this was only for shock value from 1981 on picture disc nevertheless the very best of Jimmy Swaggart silver jubilee edition oh oh, oh. <laughs> I have sinned. <laughs> yes! <laughs> How about that? Oh, this is this is so hokum. Hang on a minute. What's what's the back show? I showed this early with, with so the front oh boy. The front is by the way, it's numbered limited edition copy twelve thousand one hundred and eighteen out of fifty thousand registered number and it has his signature. And I, I kinda wonder it it might be a real signature. Some of it's faded in parts, but God knows. So Jimmy Swaggart's 25th Anniversary Ministries. But then you could go to the, here comes the flip side, Jimmy Swaggart World Ministry Center in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Oh, yes. Yes, I have seen. All right, which leads me to a question for you guys. By the way, uh, I'm sorry. I do, I do have... Uh, I got new subscribers. I am so sorry. I almost forgot this. This is important to me. Born on the Bayou, Randall Weaver. 
Elliot Cruz, David Newton, Unsightly Vinyl, Chris Proffel, Musically Obsessed, and Genealogy Mad. All are relatively new subs. Thank you very much. My question for you is this. Out of your vinyl collecting, what is the goofiest or creepiest vinyl you've ever found? Because this is just, to me, this is out there. I did not know that they made this. <laughs> and and I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm a lousy Christian. But televangelists, we won't even go there, ladies and gentlemen. But this being a picture disc on vinyl, I don't get it. I just don't get it. So along those lines, tell me in the comments, what is the goofiest or creepiest thing that you have found on vinyl in your haunts? All right, guys. Until next time, I love you, VC. I'm sorry it took me so long, but I've got some album review episodes, and I got another LP find episode I want to show you guys later. Take care. God bless. Rock on. And see you on the flip side. I have seen.